The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Building FTP Time to Exhaustion and Stamina webinar. My name is Tim Cusick, and I will be your host tonight. I am the Training Peaks WKO product leader, and I'm also a master coach at Velocious Endurance Coaching. Um, this is the point where I usually hesitate a little bit as we do have more people joining. Uh, I always give those about one minute to be late and jumping in. Thanks, Drake, for letting me know we can hear. Awesome. Hopefully, everybody can see uh, my screen. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and jump in, even though we still have some people uh, joining. Actually, there's a lot of people joining, so I'm going to delay a second. Okay, let's roll. All right, a couple of rules for tonight's webinar, um, or this afternoon's webinar, depending where you are in the world. Um, I'd like you to ask questions as we go. In today's uh, 2 p.m. webinar, I had so many great questions, it was awesome. Um, please ask the questions as you go. You can do so by opening up your, your little uh, UI here. It's on the right-hand side of your screen, typically. You can use this arrow to open and close it. You'll find one of the boxes says questions. If you click on it, it'll ask you a questions. It'll open a questions box, and you can type within that. Um, go ahead and uh, ask the questions as we go. We had the same problem. If you're trying to download the presentation, some people could this afternoon and some people could not. I don't know what GoToWebinar is doing there, but if you email me at the after the presentation at info at wko5.com, I will send you a copy of the download if you can't get it. Okay, so get ready to ask your questions, and here we go. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say here we go. How about this? Final caveat. This is my opinion. I've always said this, you know, in all these presentations, sometimes when I'm just talking about WKO5 and how do you find your athletes or how do you build a chart, those are, you know, specific facts and process. Tonight we're going to talk about a process of what is or what are things like FTP and time to exhaustion and how to improve them. So you're getting my opinion. Um, I have some background. I do work with some high-level athletes, and I understand the stuff pretty well. But absolutely, I encourage everybody to – listen and learn, but go out and vet and test and develop your own opinions and systems. It's always a little bit safer. There's a lot of people running around the internet who say things authoritarily and want you to believe them, but might not always know. You should always check. So this is just my opinion today. The order of which I'm going to go over things, <clears throat> I'm actually going to tackle time to exhaustion first. Because as I get into functional threshold power, these two are highly related. And it's easier to just get a simple definition of time to exhaustion going and then show it how it works within the explanation of functional threshold power. And then finally, I'm going to touch on stamina. Okay, here we go. Time to exhaustion. Time to exhaustion is defined as the maximal duration for which a power equal to FTP can be maintained. And to put a visual explanation on that, I've chosen to use this chart as a demo. Now, all the charts that I've used here are readily available in existing views. This is actually in the WKO5 basic view. I'm in the power duration model cycling dashboard, and I'm looking specifically, I've zoomed in the aerobic and anaerobic contribution here. I've added a time to exhaustion line. So this line is at 35 minutes and 04 seconds. And I'm going to show you how to do that a little bit later. But if you look at what's happening, time to ex exhaustion is that point where the athlete can no longer hold power. It's where the degradation and inflection point drops off. And you can kind of see it happening right here just before and just after, right? You see that inflection point dropping down where they no longer can sustain power equal to FTP. And as I like to say, they ain't coming back. Meaning, yeah, sometimes up here, you know, you get a little tired. Maybe you're 10 minutes into a, something like a longer time trial or something like that. And you drop below, but then you fight your way back and you get back up to FTP for a little while. There's a point where once you pass that time to exhaustion, you ain't coming back. Numbers, you're beginning to degrade off, <coughs> excuse me, you're beginning to degrade off FTP. And then, therefore, that 
point is time to exhaustion. Time to exhaustion can be a slightly sensitive um, number. I'm going to tell you a little trick with this later because the curve is very flat here. So subtle changes can move your TTE um, some pretty big numbers. But I'm going to tell you a little trick on how to deal with that as we talk about functional threshold power. So putting that time to exhaustion um, definition and visual in your brain, let's jump into FTP. And again, please feel free to ask questions as we go, throw them in there as we go. So let's tackle functional threshold power, FTP. That's basically the highest power a rider can maintain in a quasi steady state without fatiguing. Um, earlier today, I got the question, what is a quasi steady state? A quasi steady state is something like within a, let's call it, a, I put a number to it, which I probably shouldn't, under 5% range. So um, if you uh, have a range of, um, let's say you're targeting your FTP is 300 watts, the quasi steady state you can hold is probably, you know, 307 down to 293 watts. You know, it's not a big range. You're never going to be perfectly at 300. So the quasi steady state says maybe 5% swing one way or another. Um, now, we also have modeled functional threshold power. And John, I see your questions. I'll get to those in a couple of slides. We also have modeled functional threshold power. Your MFTP is the same exact thing. It's just simply your MFTP is the model derived highest power a rider can maintain in a quasi steady state. So we give you a modeled FTP. The power duration curve produces a modeled FTP. I find it to be highly accurate and believe it's very accurate. Um, and uh, but it's yet it's just a tool in the tool bag to help you set FTP. I see a lot of people post like, well, my set FTP this and my model FTP is that. If your set FTP and model FTP are not in alignment, um, there's two realities happening. One, maybe you're not doing the maximal efforts or following you know, the unstructured testing protocol, which I put on WKO5.com in the coaching and training with WKO5 process videos, <clears throat> which means you're just not getting in the occasional hard efforts that it takes to maintain your model, or you should really double check your set FTP. It's been my personal experience time and time again, the model has been more accurate than the human, assuming they have good data going in. They've, they've put in the efforts. They have some maximal data. Unfortunately, what happens a lot of time in threshold or setting FTP, we want it to be high. We're compelled to put it and place it high, even if it's a couple of watts high. Um, off, oftentimes, the role of data and using data analytics is it removes a bias. We tend to want to bias our FTP. The model gives us a lot of insight. <clears throat> my personal system, I do have all my athletes do the unstru so structured and unstructured testing exactly as I laid it out in those process videos on WKO5.com. And I will always round up to the nearest five. So if I have an athlete with a modeled FTP of 272, I always round that to 275. You can't be that precise. Your power meter simply isn't even that precise. You know, 272 is probably a little too precise, but I always round up just to put a couple of extra watts there for the athlete to chase. Why do I want FTP? Well, the reality is, is the single biggest determinant of racing success. It's not the only one, don't get me wrong, but if an athlete came to me and said, I want to have success, but I only have time to focus on one element of how I make power, one uh technique, one method of making and producing power, I would say raise your threshold. Excuse me, I want to take a sip of water. Two webinars a day will dry you out. Um, so FTP simply is the biggest determinant of racing success. If you look at a series of successful athletes ranging from you know a, a spring classics rider for cyclists, a mountain bike world champion, uh, a stage racer, a sprint triathlon champion, and an iron person, an Ironman champion, you're going to see that the common denominator is they have a pretty high FTP, and it really is the driver of their success. But when we say FTP and this idea of threshold, 
we've got to dig a little deeper, right, to really understand what's happening here. And this gets discussed a lot. And there's a lot of what would seem like, I don't want to call it misinformation, but we make this overly complex. So for the rest of the webinar, I'm going to reserve the right to oversimplify. Um, sometimes when you do that, some of the physiologists or people with that type of background might throw questions back at me, which I encourage, please throw them back. Um, basically, it's not that simple. But the reality is, it is. When you see what most people, the level that most people want to apply to their training, we do have to make it simpler. And that's kind of the burden of data, right? We can't just take data and, and, and leave all that complex thinking out there. We've got to simplify it. So when we start talking about FTP, FTP was designed to be an estimate of a specific threshold. Um, in the old days, you could develop or understand threshold by going to a lab, but even then you have to understand which thresholds. So basically speaking, if we look at physiology, <clears throat> you can break your physiology down into three particular zones. Now, in, these are what I would call the physiological zones. We have more training zones than three, even though some systems say you should only use those three. They're really the same. You just talk about current, you know, systems like eye levels or the classic levels. They just break down some of these higher for specificity purpose, like trying to accomplish something. But the reality is they're based on these same three zones. These zones really look at um, blood lactate and how exercise intensity affects them. Typically, when we start talking about training, we start talking about 50% of VO2 max is pretty much the basis. Anything above that, we're adding enough strain to the system, stress and strain to the system to have some effect. VO2 max is simply the maximum amount of oxygen the body can use during a specified period of usually intense exercise. So basically, anything approximately 50% above, we begin to create strain. Now, in the other end of that spectrum is 100% maximal VO2 max, right? And that's the absolute ceiling and cap. VO2 max is your maximal um, aerobic power output, and power at VO2 max is your maximal out amount of aerobic power. So you have kind of entry and the ceiling. In between there, as you begin to increase exercise intensity, you go through two transition points, or your blood lactate goes through two transition points. The first one is LT1, or your aerobic threshold. And at and there's more ways to define this. I'm just trying to keep it generally simple. Your AT and LT1 is simply the point in exercise where lactate levels first start to rise above baseline. So you're now going hard enough to calculate baseline or move your lactate levels above baseline, you're beginning to increase. So it's, again, measured by an inflection point. The line turns upward. This upward turn is usually not that steep, and it moves to, to this point, where we have another, a second inflection point, which is more steep. And this curve doesn't do it perfect justice. It's hard to do in PowerPoint. But the curve gets a little more steep once we go past LT2. LT2 or OBLA, or OBLA, or MLSS, or this is onset of blood lactate, or maximal lactate steady state, or your anaerobic threshold. These are similar, slightly different. Your maximal lactate steady state and LT2 are the highest exercise intensity at which the production of lactate and its clearance are balanced. <clears throat> the amount of lactate you're producing, you're dealing with lactate. I'll get into what dealing means in a little bit. And you've achieved a certain balance. Obola tends to be a little bit before that, but it's the exercise intensity when lactate starts to continuously accumulate in the bud. So the reality is all those are generally similar. They're reflective of that second inflection point as you increase intensity in blood lactate content. And that will shoot up very rapidly to your going to at VO2 max, and that's pretty much the maximum. Now, here's what FTP was created for. FTP, in the old days, you could only test, and this goes way back, um, and Dr. Andrew Congan created it when Andy did the work. It was really meant to be a functional estimate that you could do out on the road using a power meter that would estimate LT2 or your anaerobic threshold or your maximal lactate steady state. And the reality is functional threshold power lives right here. It's it's right in alignment with those um, 
uh, markers at the second inflection point of your uh, lactate uptick or increase. Now, here's the secret, right? You see a lot of people get into this discussion. And again, uh, this is an oversimplification, but for 99% of us, it's an oversimplification that works really well. When you see people talking about functional threshold power versus maximal lactate steady state versus anaerobic threshold versus LT2, there's the secret. The reality is when you train and you improve them, they tend to move in conjunction, meaning if your threshold power goes up 5%, your LT2 will probably go up 5%, your anaerobic threshold will probably go up 5%, your MLSS, your maximal lactate steady state will probably go up 5% they generally move in conjunction. Now, there might be minor variations, but for 99% of us, that minor variation has no impact on our actual day in and day out training. So in the end of the day, the discussion is a lot of hype, right? It's a lot of people trying to get you to think differently. Functional threshold was genius in my book. Andy couldn't have done it better. He simply gave us a simple way to go out and measure your second inflection point, right? And he called it functional threshold power because that's what it was. You'd go out, you would ride a 40K, right, as hard as you can, and that was your functional threshold power. Pretty good development. And as we've tracked it time and time and again in the lab, they'll move in conjunction with each other. Now we do have some ways to model that and to use that information differently, but we'll talk about it more in a little bit. Now, as we look at functional threshold power, we need to understand it's the maximal sustained aerobic steady state. So in this chart as aerobic and anaerobic contribution, what you have here, the red line is your power duration curve. <laughs> it's just the curve. You can see it in many places. The blue line is your anaerobic energy contribution. So you see obviously at high sprint, short times, you get a lot of anaerobic contribution but it pretty quickly dies off this athlete around in a minute. They're crossing over around a minute 10 would be my guess. And then their anaerobic contribution goes down. The green line is their aerobic contribution. So this is how much energy is coming from their aerobic system. The aerobic system responds slowly. It takes some time to get up and running, right? But it transitions over, it becomes the dominant source. But if you look here, this, look how flat it is from, I don't know, that's probably about two minutes, right? Maybe a little more, 2.15, all the way out to right where their time to exhaustion was. I could have put that line here. But if you're looking at that section, it's pretty flat. And then they hit that time to exhaustion here, and it starts dropping off. So if you think about it, where a lot of people want and where we get in trouble with overestimating threshold and where the model can give you some better insights, the model is pulling this line right? What a lot of people want to do is use the red one here at 20 minutes, but that's counting your anaerobic contribution as part of it. Your th functional threshold power is aerobic. It's your maximal aerobic steady state, sustained maximal aerobic steady state, and you can see how flat it is throughout. So when you're thinking FTP, it's that number, not this. The secret to the power duration curve is if you add the blue and the green line, they equal the red. It really is that simple. So, John, I hope that answers your questions. Okay. Now that we have an understanding of what it is, let's talk about the elements of FTP. In my book, you really have three elements that you want to think about as a coach or a self-coached athlete. There's a lot of lab elephants or ele elephants, elements and, you know, some things, uh, a deeper physiological items you might want to consider, but these are the ones that will impact you that you should be thinking about in training development. Your VO2 max, I've already defined it, the maximum amount of oxygen, right? We know what that is. That's the ultimate ceiling, right? That's your ultimate cap. It is the uppermost limit of your VO2 max is a genetic gift, right? It is a genetic gift. Your parents have given it to you, but most of us, 90% plus of us, have a lot of room to go. We're not at your genetic VO2 max. A world tour pro training 25 hours a week plus probably is at their VO2 max. Me and you sitting here today, probably pumping out 10 to 12 hours a week and training max. We're probably not even close. We have room to grow our VO2 max. Then you have maximum lactate steady state, 
that is a big part of threshold. Obviously, I, or FTP, I said it's related, it move in state, but understanding what it is is important because you can train it. Excuse me while I take a drink. So your maximal lactate steady state is the point or the exercise intensity in which maximal lactate accumulation is equal to maximal lactate clearance. And it's estimated as FTP. The point here, the word I like is maximal. You can develop your body, and we're going to talk about how in a little bit, to improve both maximals, um, produce, actually both maximals, produce less and clear more. And then finally, you kind of have this forgotten element. Efficiency is part of, it's not as big as these two, but it's part of, um, because efficiency represents the link between ATP turnover which is how you make energy at the cellular level, and the actual translation to external power output. In the end of the day, you want to develop threshold or power or increase your power, not just to increase your power. You want to move your bike or you want to run or you want to swim faster, right? The end goal was velocity, not power. So you have to start thinking about efficiency. Efficiency is, you know, how you create external power, meaning uh, it represents that link. It's uh, energy in, uh, power out, but you need to translate that to velocity. And if, the more efficient you are, the more power over time you're going to make, the more speed you'll accomplish. Now, when we look at the primary mechanisms and the response to FTP training, there's four elements you should be thinking about, right? Four uh, trainable mechanisms. So first off, you have improved fatty acid oxidation. And fatty acid oxidation, you can think Krebs cycle, you can think aerobic energy might be its simplest way to think about it. The, you produce energy aerobically, you, it's very efficient. You don't produce a lot of lactate going that way, so your body doesn't have to deal with it. And you can produce aerobic energy for a long time. The more fat you burn, right, at lower power levels, or as you train it at increasing power levels, the more efficient you are. Next, you have higher mitochondrial density. Um, the higher mitochondrial density, actually, wait, you know, when you say improved fatty acid oxidation, right, the more aerobically fit you are, the more energy you make, you simply produce less lactate. So one of the ways you can improve your lactate threshold is to produce less lactate, right, at higher powers. That will help. Then you have higher mitochondrial density, right? And this gets lost in the sauce of lactate because um, lactate is also an energy source. So the higher mitochondrial density you have, the better you can actually resynthesize lactate into energy. You can also do that in your liver and some other things, but higher mitochondrial density allows you to reuse lactate as energy better. That's uh, not actually 100% correct, but a good simple way of putting it. Next, you have a greater capillary density. That allows more oxygen to come into the system and better removal of the byproduct. So when you think about producing power, right, you have energy in and byproduct out. It's like a car engine. You need fuel coming in, fuel and air coming in, and you have to exhaust the byproduct out some way. Greater capillary density improves both more air in, more byproduct out. And then finally, you have what I call improved dealing with lactate. So you could talk about lactate shuttling, lactate buffering, lactate resynthesis. There's a whole bunch of things that you can get into the uh, the details, the, the morass of what happens in your body with lactate and does lactate acid get into your blood, which it's not really in your blood, um, and how really you're talking about hydrogen and blah, blah, blah. I've covered that in some other webinars, if I remember right. But really, part of why you're doing FTP training, you're basically dealing your body, you're teaching your body to do all the above. To you generate some proteins to help you shuttle, you improve that protein development, you'll shuttle more. You improve mitochondrial density, you'll resynthesize more. You improve capillary density, you'll get rid of more. All those things kind of, you, you get, do all that, you'll, re, you'll reduce, you'll stop your body from lowering muscle pH. You won't become as acidic, which will improve your fatigue resistance. So it really is this idea of dealing with lactate as a whole. So let's start jumping into some more practical. And again, please feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, I'm getting very few questions, which I guarantee at 8 o'clock at night, half of you guys are asleep, <laughs> which I wouldn't blame you. Um, 
let's kind of talk about, let's get into the nitty gritty of it a little bit. I'm going to try to keep this somewhat basic as best as within my capability. So when you start talking about what workouts best modify FTP, you see the little X's I have on zone one. If you use the classic levels or I levels, this is zone one physiology. Somebody asked me this question today. It would generally be your zone two of both those levels. Just think classic endurance riding. No matter how you think about FTP, just riding your bike a lot in zone two would be pretty effective. People undersell that. If you could ride 25, 30 hours a week, um, you would probably get pretty fit. Your FTP would go up higher than you might assume. Um, you might not be ready for other race elements, but your threshold would go and improve okay. Most of us don't have that, and I wouldn't suggest it as a training strategy either. Even if you had that time, there's you could get more out of that time, but it's not that bad. Just riding your bike a fair amount in zone two will improve things. But if we talk about a specific focus of building FTP, like let's say you just – in your 2020 season, your upcoming season planning, you're saying, you know what, I'm just going to raise my threshold. I'm going to focus on that for the all of my base period or first couple of months of training. There's two ways you can do that, right? Way, and both of these have been very discussed, particularly recently. Again, you have high frequency development of zone two, and then you have low frequency development of zone three. So high frequency development of zone two is you spend a lot of time in zone two. In zone two, we tend to, if you think about eye levels or the classic levels, you're thinking tempo and sweet spot. Now, in some systems, that's the no-go zone. It's the danger zone. But in this system, you know, people have begun to refer to it as the sweet spot training system. And uh, I know Andy Coggin has been talking more about it, more of a pyramid because you're spending less time here, more time here, less time there um, type of training. Sweet spot training has been around for a long time. It wouldn't, you know, in this idea of when, when we were first measuring power and figuring it out, you, you know, Andy and Hunter and Frank Overton and those guys were all, uh, Alan Lim, were pretty quick to identify the benefits of training in sweet spot in certain ways. Um, so what this means is basically you're spending a fair amount of time in that physiological zone two or your eye level zone three and four A. Um, you could do that three to five times a week, and it's progressive time and zone, meaning you're growing time. I'm going to show examples of this. Then you focus on power. The other way that has become particular of late more popular is to spend low frequency development in zone three, meaning you're spending a lot of time riding around in zone one and occasionally one to two times a week, um, more like two times a week for any you know semi-mature, mature meaning they've been training for a year or more. Um, in their history, two times a week. And that is you're really focusing on maximal high intensity efforts and you're progressive with power than time. That really is referred to now as polarized training or 80 20. And I probably bet, and I've written you know some pretty in depth articles on this, um, when it comes to these two formats, that's probably the most often, most frequent question I receive, which is better, right? Well, the reality is they both have a role in training. I think to try to categorize, categorize one as good and the other as bad is a mistake. Um, as a coach or a self-coach athlete, you should always consider all the tools in the tool bag. To me, it really is the role of time and periodization in these two methods of how to increase FTP. So I'm going to do over the series of next slides, I'm going to take you through a little case study, a format. And it's always kind of hard to explain chronological order of things. But I'm going to try to do it here. The four phases. Let's say uh, somebody on this webinar came to me and said, hey, Tim, give me a, a four-week base building block totally focused on creating FTP. This is the overview of what I might do. Now, this is a generalization. I would more individualize it to you. Remember, it's always about, like I taught you, in individualizing your training in WK05 webinar. It's about the ability of the rider meets the demands of the event. I'm just going to give you a general view of the FTP focus. There might be some other underlying focuses. So to me, you take both these techniques over time and you do it over, let's call it four phases for the help for the point of discussion today. Phase one is four to eight weeks. Actually, it's more like four to 12. If you have an immature athlete or somebody who hasn't 
I haven't ridden my bike for a year. They might need 12 weeks to get up and rolling through phase one. But typically for an athlete, training year in and year out, four to eight weeks is fine. Um, this is the aerobic foundation with a focus on extensive aerobic workouts. And I'm going to explain all these phases here in a minute. Then you move on to phase two, which is four weeks. This is the aerobic build. And here's where you can transition to intensive aerobic focus. Once you do one and two, you actually jump to a phase of four weeks of VO2 max raise. So here you're looking at max aerobic focus. Then you jump back to a phase, another FTP efficiency and economy. Here's where you're focusing again back on FTP. So I'm going to kind of go over those and break these down now. So first we start here, right? We start with this phase one and two, which are similar but different. We're going to spend a fair amount of time here in, in, in the endurance zone, let's call it zone two and eye level, zone one in our physiological model, and in zones three and four A, a fair amount of time in zones in three and four A. As a matter of fact, we would do those workouts typically three to five times a week. So the beauty of training tempo and sweet spot is you can get a pretty good gain from it without ultra high fatigue. An athlete can typically respond or can handle and still adapt three to five um, zone two, physiological zone two, zone five. I needed to find a better way to clarify that in the images, but it's zone three and four A, you know, sweet spot training, three to five sessions of three, sweet spot training a week in this phase. Um, but you want to do it as a two phase. Longer first phase, four to eight weeks, typical four to 12 weeks into a second phase of four weeks. Here's why, right? Let's look at it on the power duration curve. Again, I'm going to continue to use this curve of, uh, we're going to focus a little more on the red line. So during phase one of the PD curve, uh, there's my first typo. I, I need, forgot to fix this from earlier. PD curve extensive. It shouldn't be extortion. So it should say extensive, right? I put the time to exhaustion line in again. Here is the formula if you want to add it to your chart. You can copy this right out of the presentation. Um, right in that presentation. Um, and the reality is you want to do your work just past TTE. I'm going to give you a summary slide on all this too, but take notes or ask questions. Um, the reality is you're doing the work just below threshold power and in time range just behind, just beyond your time to exhaustion. Again, I'm going to give you some guidelines for this, but just visually looking at, you're working this space on your curve and you're simply using your eye levels or classic levels, but it's in eye levels, it's t level three and level four A, tempo and sweet spot. Now, as you move to phase two PD curve intensive, now you're doing shorter range. And I shouldn't have made that at four minutes. It's a bad example. I should have fixed both of those. Um, but the reality is it's intensive. Now you're focusing in phase two. You're doing some FTP work. You've got, you know, eight, maybe as many as 12 weeks of extensive under your belt. And then you go to intensive. Here I just go right to optimized interval utilization. So I'm doing extensive aerobic or, or intensive aerobic or extensive aerobic or FTP intervals during this phase. That's pretty much my focus. Here's a better way of showing. Now I'm going to teach you um, uh, some thinking. And the, I just got two or three questions I have a feeling I'm about to answer. Um, so here's a little summary, right? This is phase one and phase two. I could have put that on here. probably would have made it simple. So you start out with this extensive TTE type of approach. And what I mean there, right, and I'm going to jump back and forth between this slide and this slide. In the extensive, in phase one here in the red, you're taking the curve, here's the TTE, and you're attempting to pull it out. You're pulling it to the right. When you pull it to the right, if you think about what happens, you're actually raising everything, right? Everything's going to go up a little higher just simply by pulling it to the right. So the first phase, which is four to eight, maybe four to 12 weeks, you should totally focus on pulling it to the right. I'm going to show you when you should start thinking about transitioning, but that's the focus. So what you're attempting to do is extend the curve to the right. That's what you should be looking at and tracking. You're working areas of the aerobic curve at or just beyond TTE, 
at around 85 to 94 percent of power at PDC. Now, here's a different way, right? So I don't prescribe workouts by training levels. I don't use, I mean, I don't use eye levels to prescribe. My training plans do because there's no other way to do it. But as my one-on-one coaching, I do not. And the reality is um, I'm using the curve under the curve thinking. And what that is, if you follow the green lines here, and again, this is in the, in WK5, there's a WK5 advanced interval targeting view. And there's a dashboard called eye level targeting, in which case, or I'm sorry, PD interval targeting dashboard. I've got the interval targeting FTP open. Um, I added the TTE line. Um, the green lines are showing those percentages I just said. It's showing you the percentage of 85 to 94 percent. So when I'm working out in here in these extended ranges, right, and longer repeated intervals, that's what I'm working at. That's what I'm targeting typically at. So basically what I'm doing, right, since the model is reflective of your actual performing recent history, I'm using your actual rep performing history to target current intensities. Now, some athletes might be a higher percentage. It depends, right? You have to look at back at what they've done and collect the subjective data. So there's no perfect. It's not exactly 94%. You might find some athletes can handle all the way up to 96% and not really fatigue. You got to find your range for each athlete, but it'll generally be in that area, right? And that's a curve at or just beyond. Now, your time and zone work as a percentage of weekly volume of this work can be 20 to 30 percent. Actually, I have some athletes who can get up to 40 percent without too much fatigue, but I would go there cautiously. And you could just do the math for total time in 3 and 4A. Just take your ten, how many hours a week are they training? 10, 12, say 10, right? Because the math is reasonably simple. So 600 minutes. So 20% of that is 1,200 minutes. 30% of that is 1,800 minutes. Um, that's time they should can be in those zones. Some athletes, particularly mature, meaning athletes have been training year in and year out, can get up to 40%. I don't see many people getting over 40. And I was afraid to put it here because somebody would jump right to it and try it and kill themselves. Um, but it should always be progressive. I'm going to come to that point in a little bit. And progressive meaning start out at 20%. And if you can handle that and that made it easy, go to, go to the point where you start feeling the strain. We're going to talk about progression here in a little bit. <clears throat> um, then when you talk about the workout total time and zone, you want to progress that to greater than or equal to 200% of TTE. So let's say your TTE is um, 40 minutes, just making an easy number, and you're doing sweet spot work. You should progress throughout the base, throughout that four-week phase, right, throughout that work, up to the point you should attempt to progress. The top of that progression would be 200% of your TTE. So could you do up to 80 minutes of sweet spot? Um, it's a pretty good number. Most people don't think they can do it because they've never tried and they haven't worked in a time frame long enough to push that curve to the right. So, and it's progressive. You don't start at 200%, right? Start just beyond TTE, like I say, you know, and you could do that in as intervals and in modality. So, um, once you have your starting point, progress it. So let's talk about modality there. Modality means how do I put that time together? Is it two intervals with rest? Is it three intervals with rest? Is it one steady state? Well, the reality is that's really hard to answer, and that's where you really get into individualizing the answer. Um, I would typically say always make it at least two intervals in your initial thinking with an athlete and progress towards one. So let's just give a simple example, right? Let's say the athlete can do two times 20 SST and, and they're gas after that. They just can't do more. Okay. So then build them up to three times 15 with five minute rest in between, right? And let's say they get to three times 15 and then, man, they're gas. And that's probably their, maybe that's all their max can do. Or maybe they get up to four times 15 with five minutes rest in between. Now they're getting an hour of SST work in. One of the things you can do, and people don't think about this in modality, is then reduce the rest time in between to start to find out what they can handle in a row. So maybe you do, instead of five-minute rest, you take that down to three. Now they're doing 15 minutes of on 
with actually only nine minutes of rest in between, and then take that down to two. Now they're doing an 60 minutes on with only six minutes rest in between. You could also have done that maybe as two times 30 with five to seven minutes of rest, give them a little extra because they've extended it out. It's really hard to talk about interval modality. Um, it really depends on the demand of the event and the ability of the rider. That's where individualization here really plays. If they're doing longer events that require longer steady state management, you probably want to do two times 30, right, or one times 45. If they're doing things that take middle range extended efforts, classic riders, right, uh, road race, even local category road racers, right, tend to be, you know, extended periods of 10 to 15 minutes hard, then it lays up for a while. So you really have to look at that. The modality, how you apply the intervals really are about ability of the rider demand of the event. So you have to make that decision. It's hard to give really good guidance here. So once you've gotten through the extensive phase and you transition to intensive, and I'm going to give you some feedback about when, now you're trying to pull the curve up. You're working in this 10-minute area, and you're trying to pull the uh, – not just 10. You're working in a lesser area. So this area doesn't get worked in all that much, but you're working here now, and you're working to pull the curve up, pull the curve up at this phase. Oop, wrong way. Um, you're working areas of the aerobic curve 15 to 20 minutes before time to exhaustion at 95% plus power at PDC. Now, you notice I say 95%. What I actually, and again, I didn't want to put everything in here because some people just read the presentation without watching the webinar. It happened the other day. People were commenting about one of my slides, but people didn't weren't didn't listen to the webinar, so they missed the, the caveats and the warnings. Technically, when I'm doing work in here, I'm targeting all the way up to 105%, the purple line here, which I would call supra FTP, just over FTP. So you're really pulling that up from above. So somewhere between 95 and 105, but I just wrote it here as 95% plus. But that's, again, you can use that target. In the <coughs> advanced view here, the 105% line is not there. You can just simply copy the one of the other lines and change the 0.95 to 1.05, and it'll give you a purple line. So during this phase, we're pulling up, and we're doing it um, 15 to 20. So if your uh, TTE is 35 minutes, you want to be working in the 10 to 15 minute range. I never, in threshold work, when I'm building threshold or FTP, I never go below 10 minutes in intervals. Um, time and zone as a percent of weekly volume goes down 10 to 15 percent probably is your target but this is more variable mature athletes immature athletes meaning how many years of training and older athletes like myself I can't handle as much I can still handle a pretty good volume of this I simply can't handle as much as that so once you go more intensive you have to reduce that volume and be super intensive to the athlete or your own personal fatigue your workout total, total time and zone should progress towards greater than or equal to 150% of TTE. So let's say you're doing threshold work and your TTE is 40 minutes, you should be able to do an hour of threshold work, um, the, an hour of threshold work uh, as an overall workout volume. Don't start there. I want to be careful. That was my hesitation. Um, don't start there. You should be able to, and maybe because you don't have enough training hours in the week or enough weeks in your schedule, you don't get to 100, but you always want to progress. Once you're up towards 150, you're pretty fit, right? You're doing pretty darn good. If you could knock out a six times 10, if you were at a 40 minute TT and you could knock out a six times 10 minute effort, you know, workout with five minutes of rest in between, that's a heavy duty workout. So, um, that's really what you need. John, I see your questions about demoing how to do the line, but I can't demo how to do the line because I'm not actually using WK5 here. This is just a screenshot. Just go into the configuration or watch on WK5.com. There's a whole section on how to build charts. It'll show you how to do it there. Um, or just post your question in the Facebook group. I'm sure people will help too. All right, so as we move out of phase one and two, we start thinking about phase three, and we progress to phase three when we're ready. Again, I'm going to come back and summarize this, like what, when do we progress? 
And phase three is the VO2 max raising focus. That's intensive time in zone three. There's where you're going. I would say two to three times a week. I tend to never do more than three and usually stick to two. But if you have an athlete that's really new, they can't handle more than one time a week of high intensity work. And that's where you're focused on this. To me, that is purely focused on maximal aerobic power. Remember, the end goal, this is a threshold build. I might say different if it was some different type of build. But the end goal, if you say my total focus is raised threshold, that's what I would do here. Um, so the reality is you want to do that work here. How do you find out or how do you target that? Well, here I just have, I'm in the WKO base cycling view. I'm in cycling training zones. I have optimized intervals zoomed in. I'm going to resume it so you could read it. I kind of cheated there. I cut and pasted that in. Um, and I'm just focusing on those max aerobic intervals. I optimized intervals are really good. I know I created them and, and it's easy for me to say and it sounds like I want to sell you something, but I don't. They are really, really good towards giving you insights into improving your intervals. So when you go into this phase three of maximal aerobic development, just bang out a bunch of these intervals. And I'm going to show you, give you some examples here in a bit too. So just use optimized intervals. And I just have the high target. I should have spread that out to the low target. All right. Then when you're done with phase three, right, you move on to this final phase, you end it here. You got to make everything fast. You come back to your threshold work after you raise your VO2 max, but this should be done in a way of speed development. I'm not going to go too deeply at all into this because here's where we talk more advanced techniques. Um, and I really don't want anybody to get hurt or injured, but things like moto pacing, ultra fast group rides, or hardcore racing, they play pretty nicely in this final little window. So a lot of times, just before a big time trial race, and you're, maybe you're at the early in the year season, you've kind of gone through these four phases, and we're about to start time trial racing, I might have my athlete do two to three weeks of motor pacing once or twice. Remember, you're not a ton of this work. Um, ultra fast group rides, and just get in some general racing. You want to begin to translate all that improvement into velocity while you're doing a final FTP race. So let's talk about the question of how you know to progress through each phase. I'm going to give you some overarching insight and generalization here, but first let me give you a little uh, story. It really, to me, one of the cores, um, one of the cores I would build into here in tracking of when to transition, right? You're tracking your aerobic fitness. And there's some pretty good numbers. You can look at workouts and look at aerobic decoupling, power to heart rate, and you could look at a high level at aerobic efficiency, right? And all those are good numbers, but they're heart rate based and they're subject to variables. They're good color commentary. At the core, if you want to know if you have better aerobic fitness, look at your VO2 max, look at your threshold, and look at the relationship between the two. Those are the core drivers that you can measure. You can't really measure efficiency except in a lab, but you can measure VO2 max and FTP. Remember my elements, your maximal lactate steady state and FTP are related. You can measure those with power, so measure those. Here's why, right? I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm sure everybody's seen this to some degree, but it just is accurate. So when you start your training, right, and this is your training is like a house. This is your little aerobic ranch house, right? And your little aerobic ranch house has a ceiling, and that ceiling is your VO2 max. And when you start training little Johnny FTP or Jane FTP starts training here, they have plenty of room in their aerobic house to grow. So there's your phase one. They begin to do extensive aerobic work, as I've laid out, and they take advantage of that plenty of room to grow. Well, as they do that work, right, they do the training, they get taller in that house. You get more fit. Your FTP is rising. It's going up, and you're getting pretty close to that ceiling. So at that point, when you get close to the ceiling, you move into phase two. That's where you transition to intensive aerobic because closing that last little gap, that, that's not easy. You got to do some hard work to get that last little bit, right? And you bump on that phase two till you're too tall in your house. So when you get too tall in your house, you have to stop training. That's the end of phase two, right? You don't have to be as precise in transitioning from one to two, 
But when you see that point where you're bumping up against the VO2 max ceiling, that's when you have to go to phase three because what you need to do, you need to raise the ceiling of your house so you have more room to grow. So phase three, you do the VO2 max build as I just kind of laid those things out, right? And that's focused on your max aerobic power and that will give you more room to grow in the house in the final FTP phase four push. The simplest way to measure that, you have a chart, it's in your basic cycling view, it's in your power duration curve dashboard, and it's compare VO2 max to MFTP as a percentage. Track your VO2 max, it should be going. I used a really bad example here. <laughs> Somebody else pointed that out before because it's pretty flat, right? But the reality is um, you want to see the VO2 max, the red line going up, and the percentage, the purple line going up, when they stagnate, when they go flat for two, three weeks during that training period, or you're just seeing no movement, that's a point potentially of transition. Those flat points will happen between, in a trained athlete between 81 and 85%. Now, if the athlete doesn't have their MFTP, as a percentage of VO2 max up to 81%, keep doing the extensive. That's why I said extensive can anywhere between four to 12 weeks. Who knows for a brand new athlete, right? It could be 20 weeks, but there's no reason to progress on until you use up all the space in your house. You're just adding intensity for, well, you might have a reason like you're going to race, you're doing your first century in six weeks. You might have other reasons, but if you're talking about the best process, Maximize that. At least get that number up to 80, 81% before you progress on. How do you find out the individual's number? Look back over their history. See here, I can just choose different times and look back. Find their highest numbers of VO2 max and FTP percentage, right? And that should be your target point meaning those are your points of inflection. So think about what happens, right? If you go through phase one and two, you're raising the percentage of VO2 max, but your VO2 max probably is only going to come up a little bit. Then you hit that VO2 max phase, your VO2 max will go, the phase three will go up, which therefore your percentage will go down. Then you do phase four where you refocus on FTP. Now you're pulling your FTP up to the highest point. So, that um, pretty much is that track. Um, if you're having a problem with a chart, somebody's saying they can't see the percentages blank when I click on points of that graph. Uh, let's move that. You can message it to me on Facebook or submit a ticket. I just don't want to tackle it right now. I don't know why it would be blank. It could be have some bad data in there. Um, somebody asked what's a good percentage um, FTP for a master athlete. Um, it's irrelevant what's a good percentage, what's your historical percentage. 81 to 85, it doesn't get much better than 85. That's pretty much the max you're going to see. Don't get me wrong, it's a model, so maybe because of some rounding and other things, you might see 85, but that's pretty much the max you're going to see, 85. Um, typically, it doesn't change with master's athletes. The percentages will be the same because what you're, what's happening, unfortunately, for us old guys is you're losing VO2 max to some degree. Now, you can fight against that, as you know, but your VO2 max is going down. You can still train the FTP as a pretty good percentage of that. So that's how you track it. I'm not showing the perfect case study, but look back over your history, set your own targets and track it and adjust. And this goes back to my point when you're thinking about these phases, right? This whole thing, I hate to scroll backwards just because it, somebody's going to get seasick. You think about these phases, be careful with training plans. It, it's hard, right? You have to have a training plan. I sell training plans. There's training plans out there. They're good guidelines, but focus on your training strategy. You as a human being are more dynamic. You don't always fit into this neat little box. Um, and sometimes you should progress a little faster and sometimes you should progress a little slower. Um, how much you can handle, how much work, you know, that's all about managing that stuff. Have a training strategy. This is a training strategy right there. You could fill in some bullets and fill in some workouts and have a training strategy. Now, having a coach guide that, I would always hire a coach, by the way, just to say it. People who take this as a strategy and, and do it yourself, you're going to have a year or two or three of trial and error. 
most people think, well, I'll start training with power. Then once I get better at it, I'll hire a coach. Well, actually, you've got that backwards, don't you? Hire the coach so you shorten the learning curve and get the coach to help you learn that process. But you also have to be careful of being overly rigid. I write an annual strategy with my professional athletes, and we have – we, we create an outline of a plan, but we don't fill in the plan because we're reacting to the ebb and flow of dose and response to training, situational response, all those things that occur. Where we change is I have a series of metrics I'm tracking, and that's what we use to progress. Let's talk about some sample workouts by these phases. I have some very simple sample workouts here. One of the things I'm going to tell you is a secret. I have the luxury of working with pros. It's been a while since I've worked with kind of category athletes. Um, and it's funny. I don't do well with category athletes to some degree. Here's why. Because when you look at pros, I'm going to give you guys some real insight. There's no secret training. Most good world tour pros do a range of about, I don't know, six to ten unique workouts a year. <laughs> it's not like they've got these crazy unique methods and techniques and, and secret workouts. It's just they do the work. They have excellent timing and rhythm, how they develop, how they go through the phases, their own versions with their coaches of what I've just showed you and what their focuses are. They train a lot. They have natural gifts. They understand how to listen to their body. You know, it really is all that stuff more than the secret workout. So sometimes when people are like, share workouts how you get there, I share the workouts. It's kind of like letting the air out of the room. You're kind of disappointed because there was no secret workout. And I don't I don't have that. As a matter of fact, one of the secrets to pro training, they can handle the boredom of doing the work they need to do. I call it bread and butter. They can take it. They don't need the motivation of unique and and, and different workouts every day. They go out. It's their job. It's the work they do. But I'll try to give you a little bit of both. One or two of these might gain some insight. So in my four phases, this is what I'm looking at. You know, you always have a fair amount of base miles, and you're riding a base miles in between your higher intensity workouts. Tempo and long tempo work. I'm going to give deeper samples here after this slide. Intensive aerobic is tan tempo, some SST and a lot more FTP focus. FTP build, super threshold and max aerobic work. And then when you come back to FTP, here's you're doing your speed work, your motor pacing and racing at threshold, close to threshold. All right, so two sample workouts here in your FTP build. Um, base miles, here's a trick to base miles, right? So if you're using classic or eye levels of base miles, and let's say you have a 250 watt threshold and your base mile, your zone two is 150 watts to 190 watts, right? I don't know if that's right. I'm kind of working out of memory, but pretend that's your, your zone two, right? And write this down as a note because it will help everybody listening, I have a feeling. As a coach, when you prescribe that to athletes, um, category athletes and, and, and performance athletes, they say, oh, my zone is zone two. That means I can go from 150 to 190. They go 189 watts <clears throat> every time you prescribe it, right? Here's a secret. If you would have ridden that at 165 watts or 189 watts, there's no physiological gain. There is a tiny one. I shouldn't say no. A very, very tiny physiological gain for riding the uh, 24 extra watts. But yet there is a much higher fatigue for riding the 2400 or the 24 more watts. When you are working in a zone two, work in the middle of zone two. If you look at pros, they tend to work at the bottom middle of zone two because they'll ride longer. Because you, if you use that high side, you know, and really get up there, you're really just creating additional fatigue for very marginal gain in the aerobic effort. Um, if you're going to ride tempo, we'll go ride tempo. But if you're going to be zone two and your base miles ride in the middle, you will reduce fatigue in the system and get the same aerobic benefit. Tempo ride. I like to do tempo and, and some cadence work. I do a fair amount of tempo work in uh, this phase. Here's just one of my classic workouts. I take tempo as a 145-minute effort, but then progress out. It should be to eventually to, to 50, 55, 60. You know, always be progressing. I never do one more. Than, I never do more than two workouts at the same time range. And typically only do one. It's only if they struggled to do at 45 minutes, would I repeat 45 minutes, but then I'm going to move on to 50. 
always be building, always be progressing, right? We tend to sit very stagnant and repeat the same workouts time and time again. And all the grind is, is I break it up into three equal sections with 45 minutes, we're talking 15, and I do low cadence to mid cadence to high cadence throughout the effort. That sounds a little reverse intuitive, but the reality is you're working on muscle memory in this phase. Also, you're working on, you don't want to teach your body. A lot of us teach our body to grind down in the winter. We're doing tempo, we're riding Zwift, we're doing those things, right? And we start out with high cadence and we end up with low cadence. That's counter efficiency. You're more efficient to keep your cadence up. So simple ways to work on improving cadence as you fatigue. And another one which surprises people is long tempo. So steady state tempo targeted at a percentage of goal, like 85% of FTP, go longer and longer and target towards that percentage target. A lot of people do tempo. They start out at 45 minutes. They, they do a bunch of 45 minutes. Then they do a bunch of 60 minutes and they never keep progressing tempo beyond 60 minutes. You'd be surprised um, how much tempo somebody can ride if they try. And if you look at a lot of like category racing here in the U.S. and, and a lot of other countries, um, you spend a lot of time in tempo. Um, progress 45 minutes to an hour, and to an hour and 15, to an hour and a half. Um, I have a professional athlete who rides four hours of tempo. I've consulted with a pro, a, a, a men's world tour rider, a U.S. climber who's had a tough couple of years, who there's points the guy was doing seven hours of tempo which was part of the problem, by the way. But don't go out and do seven hours of tempo, no matter who you are. Um, but progress it out to you hit the percentage targets that we talked about. Don't be afraid to just go longer and longer in tempo. We put, a, we put an artificial cap on tempo for some reason, like an hour is good enough. If you want to continue to improve, you've got to continue to progress. It is that simple. Now, as you move into intensive, I switch over to tempo to what I call tan tempo. I don't call it tan tempo. Andy named it that, Dr. Andy Coggin. It's funny, we were having this conversation about training one day, about how we used to train before power meters and how power meters then taught us this was pretty cool. Um, I was telling him the story. I have this like hour and 15 minute loop by my old house that I used to use for training. And my training was twice a week. I would go out and ride that as fast as I could. And it had a lot of turns on it and uh, rollers and risers and things like that. So I would just you know, stay seated, ride hard, surge out of turn, surge up the hills, um, and just try to generate the most speed I could. Because what I was trying to train, I didn't have power then, right? I was trying to make the lap as fast as possible. And someday, one day I was telling Andy that I had a one hour and 15 minute course, and I actually had a three hour course. And I knew if I could do the three hour course in three hours or under, I was ready to race. That was my, that's how I used to train way back in the day. Um, the I was telling the story to Andy one day, and he's like, I did the exact same thing for 10 years. I called it tan, tough as nails. And that's really what it is, right? And basically all you're doing is you're going out for a longer tempo ride, and you're mimicking being in a break, not a crit. I don't want you over-accelerating and standing up at every turn and dropping a 1,000 watts. You're staying seated and you're surging. You're still not creating a super high VI, but watch your average power, not your normalized power. It's going to be a little higher. And target your average power at 85%. And it gets pretty hard. Tan will push you. Um, find your course, right? And look to add a little power. Look to go a little faster. It's a simple way to do it. But also, can, whenever we think tempo, right? We think I'm going to go to 250 watts and just hold it there forever, like the perfect drone. Sometimes mixing it up is good, too. So tan tempo is fun. And then just good old-fashioned FTP intervals, you know, take 110 to 150%. I gave you the numbers before, so start at about 110% of TTE. Break it down into different interval modalities, 4 times 10, 2 times 15, whatever your target ends up being, you know. In, in that should, remember when I say interval, should always be affected. If you're a 40K time trial specialist, you might want to start out with 2 times 20 and quickly get to to, you know, two times 30 and then maybe one times 50, you know, that type of deal. Think about your modality and progression that way. Um, if you're somebody who just needs 10-minute surges, you might want to go four times 10 or three times 10 to four times 10 to five times 10. That's where your individuality or your individualization comes in. Just simple workouts in that range. Then when you get into phase three and now you need to build that aerobic, you're raising the ceiling, 
just do max aerobic interval workouts. I already showed you what that is, three to seven minutes. The guidance is there in optimized intervals. Now, you can also think about doing those in um, – in a uh, in the Tabathia, Tabeda, Tabeda, Tabatha um, format, micro on offs, right? And those are good also. And basically, what you're doing is you're taking the time segment. So an example is you're taking six times, thirty seconds on, fifteen seconds off, repeated eight times, which is about six minute total, I think, if the math is right. You never know with me. Um, so basically, you're doing the interval a little bit longer, but you're doing it in an on-off fashion. And your 30 seconds is hard, and your 15-second recovery is easy. The reality is there is no tested difference between those interval formats, meaning whether you did them as steady state or as in Tabata style, they're the same meaning the results tend to be the same. The steady state will give you a slightly better cardiovascular response and more time at or near VO2 max. And the um, high intensity approach, the Tabata approach, will give you a slightly higher neuromuscular response, but the end result of performance tends to be the same. So when people say, well, which one should I do? Whichever one you like better. Whichever one is more fun whatever one you produce more power. Now, when you're executing the high intensity intervals, the 30 seconds ones on are hard. You are going FRC, FTP, target or higher. Just go as hard as you can, really. They self-regulate really quickly because that rest is not very long. When you're designing these, the classic Tabata was 20 seconds on and 10 seconds off. I like that one, but it's hard to actually do. Everything's so short, it comes too fast. So 30, 15 is a little easier to execute. Um, and just go as hard as you can for the 30. By the second or third one, it'll self-regulate. Don't go as, like, sprint hard as you can, but go hard. Your body will quickly find its natural balancing point. Um, now, when you're designing these, don't rest more than 15 seconds. So one of the mistakes I see in a lot of Tabata style intervals is it's like 30 seconds on and 30 seconds off. That kills the effectiveness of the technique because the recovery time is too long. Your aerobic system, your anaerobic system are recovering too much in the 30 seconds off. The literature will tell you 20 seconds is the max. If you read a lot of studies, it'll say that the maximum off time is 20 seconds. But the reality is everybody cheats a couple of seconds. So make it 15 seconds so you're sure. Um, you could do these as 40 15s or 40 20s, 40 seconds on and 20 seconds off. I also would not extend the on period beyond 40 seconds as power tends to drop off significantly if you extend the on period beyond 40 seconds. My favorite, easy to track, easy to think about, 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off. Go hard when you're going hard, coast, soft pedal when you're going easy, let your body find its own natural range. Um, and that'll happen pretty quickly. Um, don't stare at the power meter 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, you'll crash. Now, I did not do a slide for the final FTP of build because I'm not going to show moto pacing workouts and stuff like that. It's too dangerous. Hire a coach, read appropriate literature, um, learn it. But your final phase of FTP building is very intensive, meaning you should be doing some maximal FTP efforts. Race the local, you know, by that time in the spring, a lot of areas have local TTs or things like that. Just get out there and race the local races, the training races, the TT races, and things like that. If you have somebody that's highly trained in motor pacing, that is a significant advantage. I would highly recommend if you can learn to do it safely, you do it, um, but learn to do it safely. So I did not write up a final phase slide with sample workouts. So those are just ideas. Sorry it's so simple, but that's it. So that's pretty much my FTP building. That's FTP and TTE working together in a systematic approach. Somebody asked me about TTE. One of the things I do with TTE because it's so sensitive, meaning it can jump from 35 to a minute, particularly in somebody who has a very flat curve. Um, I use an exponentially weighted moving average of 28 days. So I smooth out TTE. Um, I wasn't going to share that secret. I can't keep giving away all my secrets. So at some point, I need a job. I need to be coaching. Um, <laughs> if you're smart enough to create an exponentially weighted moving average, EWMA, 
of TTE over the course of 28 days, you'll find it'll smooth out the number quite nicely and give you an excellent target to use. If your data set is robust, it usually isn't jumping around much, but the exponentially weighted moving average will give you a good TTE target when you're thinking about what I put together all the way back here, um, you know, and when you're thinking about this slide. TTE, if you're TTE because you don't have great data, you're not doing the unstructured testing, which I teach in the WKO5.com education center under coaching and training with WKO5 process, if you're not following that, your TTE might jump. Um, I find as long as the data is robust, it stays pretty steady, but I still run the exponentially weighted moving average, so when I'm using these as targeting ideas, I know it's not getting jumpy. All right, let's move on to stamina as it's getting late. I'm on my usual schedule. So stamina, I don't have a lot of slides here. Stamina is a measure of resistance to fatigue during prolonged duration, moderate intensity, i.e. below sub-threshold or sub-FTP exercise. Units are a percent of maximum, 0 to 100%, although most individuals fall in 70 90%. Again, this is way easier to visually um, see it. So here you simply have, here is threshold FTP. And imagine if you never fatigued off FTP, that would be 100%, right? Obviously that's not possible. This is a degradation. You're falling off FTP. Stamina simply is a percentage representation of that drop off rate. It's not the drop off rate at a specific time because somebody might have a five hour long time and somebody else might have a two hour long time. Um, so the reality is uh, it's just a measurement of that percentage. Now, why do you want stamina? Well, it's the ability to reduce the decline in power output over extended durations. You can simply go harder longer, right? Stamina is a hard metric to use in training because you're not really training towards a stamina number, you're training to improve the stamina number. So it really is hard to use in that training point because what it really is saying is if your stamina goes up, you reduce your susceptibility to fatigue over time. Now, when people say, I want to train my stamina, it's a high cost because at the end of the day, you need volume. That's what builds stamina. Um, so there is, for those who don't have quite the time, there is a high correlation of stamina and FTP, and this goes true. You're talking about ultra runners and Ironman comp Iron Man comp competitors, um, marathon 24-hour riders. The higher your threshold is, the higher your stamina is going to be. So working threshold is important for those people. I would work it building some of the traditional protocols and things like that. I would focus if I was a ultra runner or a, a iron man. I don't coach any triathlon anymore, but I, I have a running background back in the day also. Um, I would focus on extensive version building. You don't want a lot of threshold time frame for iron man or longer events because you want to really focus on your fatty acid oxidation side. Um, and then finally, I would add some tan and, and extended tempo. Most long distance, long duration athletes already have the extended tempo, but do some in the tan format. We get too drone, get too single speed, and you know, mixing it up a little will kind of send a better adaptive signal. And you just simply need to go long, pace volume. Yeah, right, that's a big secret. <laughs> Meaning you got to go long at the pace, you got to do higher volumes at the pace that you expect to be able to do, if not above it. You need long, steady rides and fat burning rides. I wish I had better insight to stamina in that way, but stamina is a measurement of, it's hard to train to. Now, if you're doing good training and you're saying, is what I'm doing helping improve my ability to go longer, harder, stamina is an excellent measurement metric. It's just not like FTP or TTE used in a training targeted process. Okay, now before I go to open Q&A, and I know I have one or two hanging questions, but I've been keeping up pretty well, I want to make a general announcement that I will post on Facebook here in the next couple of days. Um, I'm heading over to Worlds on Monday to Harrogate in England, and I'll be there for a couple of weeks. When I return, we're going to kick off a new series. So right now, this final webinar completes the basic WKO series, which are getting started with WKO5, individualizing your training with WKO, building PMAX and FRC with WKO, 
and building FTP, TT, and stamina with WKO. So those four will be public and will be published. We're going to go to a more advanced set beginning in the middle of October, which will start with breaking down your 2019 season. These will be more hands-on and case study-ish, which will lead into annual planning with WKO, which will lead into better base building with WKO, which will lead into better performance. So let's call it race performance, event performance with WKO. So we're going to have a more hands-on series. But in the future, those uh, webinars will be limited to WKO5 users only. And when you register, you're going to have to put in your registration code. There's two reasons for that. And again, I'm going to put this on Facebook. And as you guys know, I'll be very transparent and discuss it openly with everybody. One is we've got so many new users and so many people um, if there are, it's hard to get into the more advanced topics and treat the people who want the more advanced topic equally when a lot of newer people, you know, are just catching up with the data. So we're going to have WKO5 users in there and getting and taking, in, you know, advantage of a more advanced approach and learning curve. And then two is I want you to buy WKO5 and get engaged in the higher level and the evolution because a lot of the stuff we're going to be looking at in these advanced webinars are going to be specific to WKL5. And that's just a reality of it. And it is, we're always going to give the education away free. There's an excellent set of education for WKL4, a very, very, very deep and robust set. Um, but as we evolve on into using all of these new science, training intensity scores and, and dynamic FRC and improved a couple of other things that are coming down the pipe, I know I'm not allowed to let out secrets, it really has to be, it's really in subjective data, which is a big part of what we're going to be teaching in this cycle. Um, you really have to be a WKO5 user to get it. So that's it. I just want to tell everybody that personally. I know some people are going to be cheering that because you're the WKO5 advanced user who wants the more advanced information. Some WKO3 and WKO4 users might see that in the wrong light, and I understand that might be a frustration, but it is the way we're going forward. Um, now, I'm going to answer questions. You can drop off in these questions. If you did not, we're not able to get the PDF to download. I don't know what's wrong with uh, GoToMeeting. Email me at info at WKO5.com, and I will reply back sending you the PDFs. So it's info at WKO5.com. All right, the only question I didn't think I can get to, and you guys can feel free to ask more. If you don't want to hear the question, just go ahead and drop off. Um, oh, I think I just deleted the question I moved. If I just deleted your question and didn't answer it, I'm sorry about that. Repost it or ask it real quick or send it to me. Shoot, I clicked on the wrong one. There was one question I know I hadn't answered and I deleted it by mistake. Um, a. Arnold, it was you who had asked the question. And maybe I already answered it, but if not, restick it back in there real quick. Um, sorry about that. Thinking of weekends, what is a good approach towards mixing long tempo and SST? Um, I wouldn't mix those two, Javier. I'd do either long tempo or SST. So make the Saturday your higher intensity day. So maybe that's the day you do a fair amount of SST or a super or a long tempo. or And then just go out and ride endurance on Sunday or flip-flop those two. But um, – if you're pretty well trained and can do both, do the SST on Saturday and the tempo on Sunday. So do the slightly higher intensity while you're a little fresher and then the slightly lower, longer while you're a little more fatigued. I wouldn't mix them into one workout um, because they're really sort of doing the same thing, right? You're going to end up going not hard enough in the SST work and not long enough in the tempo. Just separate them out and do them. Um, Oh, here's somebody posted, I got the handout link to work in Safari and Firefox, but not Chrome. Yeah, I wonder if Chrome is blocking, so that's a good point. No worries, I'll send it out to you if you can't get it to work. Okay, so the question that was asked, do I understand correctly, slide 20, when you said target 84 to 90% of PDC, yes, that is, yes. In the time range, take 84 to 90% of your PDC curve value. So if you're doing 40 minutes, that's your target, 84 to 90% of that range. Now, remember, that was a generalization. Um, 
if you look at the targets, if you could do a little more, you got to find your specific range. It's pretty findable. I mean, you're going to know just by doing it and be like, man, I can do 92% and that felt right. Don't, don't use, you know, don't excuse away those feelings. If 92% is you've come back and you do the workout and you analyze it and be like, man, I, I, I was doing 91. I could have went a little harder, go out tax time and do 92. And then I'm like, that's the spot. Make your range 90 to 93. So I'm giving you a generalized range to start with, but you can target yours closer and tighter. So if you may have answered, how would you fill your training week when doing phase three? I would just ride endurance. When you're in phase three in high intensity, most people bring on too much fatigue in those kind of phases. So you don't leave your body the energy to adapt. Go hard two days a week maybe two and a half, all the rest should be easy endurance rides. Middle to lower zone two, not the high end of zone two. Just ride endurance. And you might do some cadence work in there. You might do some other skill development in there, but don't don't add other intensity. You need to leave your body enough energy to adapt. Close assessment of LT1 or AT power from the aerobic anaerobic contribution chart. Yeah, the crossover point, Chris, that's a great question. I keep meaning to do some work in that area. Um, we need to pull that out. It, it's there. It, it is something. I would think it's a little beyond the crossover point because it's the logarithmic nature of the curve, and it really is measuring maximal intensity. Um, but there's other ways I think we could see it. Um, the problem is it's a more subtle inflection point, as you probably know. Um, so it's kind of hard to pull out of power data because you can roll right through it without it creating any change. We need to, but that being said, the point the two curves intersect is a point of crossover, and that is insightful also. So I kind of ducked your question, I guess. So let me be clear. We don't have a way of identifying LT1 or aerobic threshold. We do have that crossover point to give us insight, but that's insight kind of in the in the maximal approach. Um, it depends what you want to use it for in training. A lot of lactate measurement systems will use LT1 to LT2 as a, a, a setup for training intensity, so I want to be a little hesitant to answer that. That being said, it's it is doable. We just haven't put the focus on it. It's something we need to get to. Okay, I think I've answered everybody's question. Thank you so much for attending. If you don't have the uh, webinar uh, presentation, email me at info at wko5.com. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.